Okay, so my devotion is the person of the Holy Spirit. And the um, verse that I'm using is John 14, verse 26. It says that the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So my target audience that I wanted to use was a connect group. And I wasn't sure what to do next, so I kind of... <laughs> um, so with the them, us and me, um, I, so then is the Old Testament church. Yeah. Um, so the Holy Spirit is our advocate. And this, um, an advocate is someone that puts a case forward on someone else's behalf, looks after them and teaches them. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. People in the Old Testament had an awareness of God's Spirit. However, they connected it to things such as breath and wind which came from the Hebrew word ruach. Um, so an example is in Genesis 2 verse 7, then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. They were aware, so we, the church were aware that um, of the close connection between breath and life. Therefore, this connection led them to use the term spirit. To understand and know the person of the Holy Spirit is to first want, first we first must have to have a closer relationship with God the Father. And then us is um, the New Testament church and today's church. So we're a spirit-filled church and we flow in the gifts of the Spirit, whether it is preaching, teaching, or prophetic, or any of the other gifts that we reference in our lecture, exhaustive or illustrative, natural or supernatural. We baptise people in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit and reference the Holy Spirit as a person. It states in the create, Created for Community that through our union with Christ and his community, we participate in the fullness of the Spirit. Because we are believers, we have experienced Pentecost. We have received the endowment and empowerment of the Spirit. In fact, we do not have the Spirit if we do not belong to Christ. Um, so in Romans 8, 9, it says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And, Christ um, and so the Holy Spirit gives us strength, protection, comfort and direction. And me personally, my personal relationship with God and what he's saying to me, um, he said for me personally, the Holy Spirit is someone that I constantly speak with. He is the personal presence of God with me. The Holy Spirit alights the God-given gifts within me. And the more that I get to know him, the more I'm aware when he is speaking to me. Um, depending on the situation or the journey that I'm in, God equips me with the gifts that I require for that circumstance um, and shows the diversity of those gifts in me through the Holy Spirit. Like in worldly friendships or relationships, the more we spend time with a person, the better we get to know them and their personality. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. The more I build the relationship and get to know him, the more I'm able to hear and learn from him. This enables me to live a spirit-filled life with a personal companion, the Holy Spirit. Um, okay, um, I've chosen spirit baptism for my devotion. So, um, I have chosen the books of Acts for, for, as a reference. Acts 19, verse 1 to 6, where it says, um, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what way, what then were you baptized? And they said, into John baptism. 
Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hand upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now, how does that relate to them? Um, I've done a bit of research and a few controversies, but I'll try to stick to what Pentecost we believe. Um, so these people that Paul has encountered were disciples, but not of Christ. Rather, they were self-identified disciples of John the Baptist, which says it, which it stipulates in verse 3. Um, they were not believers in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Paul's question about their conversion experience reveals that they knew nothing of the Spirit or His power. In verse two, um, they had the first. They have taken their the first step of repentance of sins, but they have not taken the corresponding step, um, the faith in Christ. Um, they have been baptized for repentance but they had not heard the whole gospel message. John the Baptist's ministry was one of preparation for people to receive Christ. Um, I've taken Mark 1 verse 2 for that as reference, where he preached repentance of sins, and as people repented, they showed their change of heart by an outward cleansing of the body. Um, but simply repenting of sin is not enough. We must have Christ. John himself understood the limitation of his ministry. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So that's Matthew 3, verse 11. Um, so Paul explained to the disciples the details of Jesus' death and resurrection, the essential elements of the gospel and told them to believe um, once the men received Christ by faith, the Holy Spirit, true to form, filled them with his presence. They became new creations. Um, in, I read that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and they started to speak in tongues and prophesy. Now, how does that relate to us? I mean, I found that very short, but um, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Christians step out of their natural realm into a real in, into a realm where they they begin to experience the supernatural gifts and the powers of God, God's Holy Spirit in their life, like speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now, how does that relate to me? Um, spirit baptism has changed the way I pray. I know that the Holy Spirit is just there, um, waiting, um, ready to embrace me. When I need it, <laughs> I have discovered the power of the Holy Spirit for the, for He dwells in my life every day. I've also learned that the Father gives the Spirit to those who ask Him, as I refer to Luke eleven verse thirteen. If you then, through you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Thank you, Brian. Hi, everyone. <laughs> cool. Well, tonight for my devotion, um, I'm going to be talking to you about sanctification a bit, rather than conversion. I got the choice of that one. So the scripture that I'm going to read to you from is from the book of John in chapter, uh, chapter 17, verse 14. It says, this is Jesus talking, I've given, sorry, I have to zoom in. I've given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world, 
anymore than I love the world. My prayer is that is not that you take them out of the world. Sorry. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So, the target audience of my devotion tonight is for a connect group, whether that be upper, um, upper age youth or young adult connect group, and how this relates to them. So the gospel, this gospel was written by the Apostle John, one of the disciples of Jesus. And during the gospels, um, they recount over many of the key moments of Jesus' life and the time he had here on earth up until his death. And that included the miracles he performed, the individuals he encountered and their transformations and um, the teachings he brought. And this passage of scripture reads where Jesus is praying for his disciples. So this, before this prayer, he was actually speaking to his disciples and um, moments, um, just chapters before, you know, he predicted his own betrayal and he, pre- he predicted um, one of his disciples, Peter's denial of him. And, you know, his disciples were asking all asking him all these questions and it did and it led to their reassurance of their belief in Christ and all that he said and during this time not only for the disciples but all, for all believers for all Christians um, it was a great time of persecution among the church um, and it was because um, a key a key point to this was because the Pharisees, um, who were the, I guess, local leaders at the time, felt at threat of what Jesus was doing among the communities, and um, I researched into it a little bit, and it was because the Roman Empire obviously was in charge of um, all the, all the, I guess, the Jewish hierarchies that were going on at the times, and you know, the Pharisees who, who, who felt secure in their control over the people, um, was scared of that leading their hands by what Jesus was doing and what he was um, standing for and what he was trying to, um, I guess, achieve among all the people that he encountered. Um, so that that part, um, just before this passage of scripture, it talked about um, how the Pharisees were plotting to kill Jesus and uh, them referring to how the Roman Empire were going to take away everything. That's in John chapter 11. Um, so this, how this relates to us is that, you know, anyone that uh, believes in Christ and in his word um, will face challenges and will face trials. And, you know, God has called us to be in this world, but not of it. And, you know, when we give our lives to Christ, we are one with him. And as Jesus alludes to this fact um, in this scripture, that we are um, that we are one with him, that he, he relates to us, that we relate to him. And, you know, it says here in um, 1 John 2, that whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And so that we as Christians are to follow the example of Jesus and learn from how he lived and how he did life. Even though, like the disciples, life wasn't always easy and through, and whether that be because of rejection or persecution um, with people who don't yet know Christ, um, you know, it's going to happen because we can see and what we can learn from Jesus is that he experienced that and he went through that. Um, in this in this passage in John, it says in verse 17, sanctify them by truth and your word is truth. So we, was, so we must remember when we read this to um, constantly, 
be engaged with God and to know his truth so um, we can we can represent him and we can um, share his truth and not be like the Pharisees who were who thought they knew truth but didn't know Jesus to actually know the truth um, and you know that's what sanctification is it's that part of that salvation process um, so for me my everyday choice is to choose um, to be sanctified, to choose um, to be set apart, to choose God's will for my life and to be actively seeking him and deciding that that declaration I made when I converted to become a Christ follower is a commitment for life. It's not just, it's not just words that we say that we um, that just go out into air but you know it is it is powerful, it is something that really means something to not only us but means something to God and this relates to me personally through tough situations that I've experienced whether that be with people who are close to me who, who don't know Christ personally it can be hard it, there's, there's times where that that I can personally feel rejected by individuals or times where um, people might you know say things I guess against uh, Christian believers and things that are really challenging and can be really hard to, I guess, um, be standing in front of those words. But you know, we can be encouraged and learn from the example of Jesus that you know it wasn't we weren't called to do this life just because it's going to be hard and it's I said that wrong. We weren't <laughs> we weren't. Um, called to do this life um, because it was hard and that because we were going to do it on our own but it's because you know we have God with us and you know we've been set apart to do great things and we're not to be of the world but just to be in it and represent Christ thank you <laughs> Cool, that was good. Um, okay, so we're going to go into the nature of the church. Um, just wondering if it's the yes, it works. Awesome. Um, so before we start, when we say um, church, what comes to mind? Um, what words come to mind when you think about the word church? Money. Money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that come to mind. Anyone else? The people. The people, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Pastors. Pastors, yep. Yeah. Elders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could go on. Yep. Yeah. Jesus, definitely. <laughs> that's right. Let's go. Cool. Okay, well, um, it's hard, it's actually hard to theologize about church because when we say church, we think about, no, oh, it didn't work. Um, if we think about so many different things, we think about denominations, we think about, sorry, a bit loud, thank you, <laughs> um, the different ways that we structure ourselves, um, our styles, um, everything like that. We even think about the building, we think about, um, yeah, all that stuff. So um, to, to each person, church actually might mean a different thing. Um, and in the book by uh, Craig Van Gelder, this is actually in your recommended. Oh, uh, it's in your recommended reading list. You don't have to, but if you um, are able to, it's a good book to read about church. I haven't read it to be honest, but I heard it's a good book. Yeah, sure. Sorry, question: What's mm -hmm. para church? Oh, para church. Uh, so it belongs to a church, but it's not a church. Oh, like compassion. Uh, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah that okay. Um, okay. So he says the church is, the church does what it is, and the church organizes what it does. So the nature of the church is connected to what it does, which we will cover um, in the second lecture. But we've separated it because we can't cover everything all at once. Um, so let's start with a word study. 
the Greek word is ecclesia, which is why the study of church is ecclesiology. And um, I don't know how to pronounce it. Ek e means out of and kaleo to call. So ecclesia means the called out ones. Um, that's the root word and all that. Shane Clifton says he's not too um, excited about going to the root words because you really need to look at uh, what the meaning has become in its context. But it's still really helpful. So in the Greek speaking world, ecclesia actually is quite a general word. It means an assembly. All right. Um, why, would, why would the New Testament writers choose this word, an assembly, rather than a synagogue or something that, you know, would translate from Judaism to Christianity? What do you think? Why did they choose the word assembly? Not only notes. <laughs> it's just something to think about. <laughs> Is it because the synagogue was literally a place? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the reasons that we believe. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Anyone else? Any other guesses? It's like a group of people. Sorry? A group of people. Yeah, a group of people, definitely. So, um, an assembly is more, um, it's more than a religious structure, like Mark said. It also is a word that everyone understands, and because it's a gathering of people, it's quite a missionary word, as Jane said. Um, there's a missionary element to this word. Um, so, and it's a very Pentecostal way of describing church. That's the way that we look at church, as a gathering rather than a religious meeting as such. So, um, in the Bible, um, this is where Ecclesia is used as a public meeting. This is, isn't necessarily the church, it's just a general use of the word in Acts 19. Meanwhile, some are shouting one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. Um, it also means a local church, which is more a common uh, way that the New Testament writers used it in to mean a gathering of Christian people, usually in a person's house. But that's not the only way that church was um, conducted in the New Testament. A lot of people who are for house churches usually say, well, that's the way it was done. But there are other ways of doing church in the New Testament. This is just one of the ways. It also means the church in a particular region. Um, so Acts 8, that day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. So it's referring to all the house churches there. And it also means the universal church, all of us, all together. Um, and it is a mistake to think that when we are trying to develop a biblical basis for this doctrine, that we just type in the word church to search in um, the Bible to try to figure out what it says about it, because the whole of the New Testament is about the church. It's about how the church is formed. Paul writes letters to churches that are having problems. So really, um, the whole of the New Testament is about the church. Okay, so... So... Um, Scholars have tried to put um, a description to the church using images and all that, and we'll look at four of the ways it is done in the New Testament. The first one is the people of God. So 1 Peter 2 verse 9, that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And this draws on the link to Israel as Yahweh's chosen nation, his people who are called out. If you remember, Ecclesia means called out, called out of Egypt, called out from among the nations to live for him, doing his will, which is then um, linked to the Ecclesia, who are called to do the same, to stand out in their world. And one of the interesting debates in the New Testament revolves around uh, replacement theology or fulfillment theology, which is is the church the fulfillment of the Old Testament? Or does God's favor toward Israel move towards the church? So replacing Israel and putting them to the side. What do you think? I don't have an answer. That's just a debate that's out there. Okay. So do you think that the church is the fulfillment of the Old Testament? You know, all the promises... Um, to have land, all the promises where um, God's uh, word is written on our hearts, all of that stuff. Are we a fulfillment of that? Or do we replace 
Israel in that. So all those promises are now pushed aside and we replace Israel and God starting afresh because Israel stuck up, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> um, God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were mm. trying to your seed will be a blessing to the world, to yeah. be blessed through you. Yes. And that's what the New Testament is, is yeah. through Jesus who was the seed of Abraham, Isaac, yeah. and Jacob. Um, yeah. We're blessed through that. Mm, um, so definitely. That's the fulfillment of your testament in that respect. Yeah, definitely. So, really, biblically, I don't know how people can argue for the replacement theology, but mm. some people still do. Um, yeah. yeah, if you dig de- de- deeper into theology, there are some very interesting discussions out there. Um, and, and what's interesting is that, okay, so just talking through the pictures, um, on the left is the Tel Aviv Museum. You can't really see it, but there's a little blue sign on the building that says uh, 43, I think. That is the house of the first mayor of Israel. Um, and this is a statue of him. And this is where they declared um, the independence of Israel in 1948. It had to be a secret because it was just before the British mandate was over, so just before the British left. And they didn't want um, the British to tell them, no, you can't do this. So they did it secretly. They sent out a message among all the Jews. They secretly came together, declared it, and the next day, um, Egypt bombed Tel Aviv and the Arab-Israeli war started. Um, Israel against all the Arab neighbors, so that's a bit crazy in their um, history. But um, I put it up there together with the, um, so I put out a picture of the Western Wall before. This is under. The original wall is, I don't know, three, four times more than that section that we see today. And so that's an underground bit of it. That, they believe, is the closest to the Holy of Holies. So the women actually take turns to pray there. And the reason I put these pictures up is because um, the Jews really believe that they are the ones that the promises are for. Um, as, as Christians, you know that it includes us as well. But for them, that's what they believe in. And if we look at history, it's incredible. You read about all the um, other nations that were present in ancient Israel times, and they are no more. You don't hear about them anymore. Uh, once they're displaced from their land, they're gone. But for the Jews, no matter how many times they've been displaced, their identity held that God is going to give us our land. We are a people. His presence holds us together. And they've survived um, centuries and centuries of displacement. And um, so that's what they believe. So anyway, just a side note. Um, Okay. So the second image that we have is the body of Christ. And this is a great one because it, it tells us about how we are to be together. Just as a body has many parts, and we are all one and not everyone's a head not everyone's an eye and that's the power of the church it is in our diversity it is in um, what we each bring and we tend to hang out with people who are like us but we actually learn a lot from people who are not like us in the church which is quite incredible Um, and gifting as well the idea that we all have a different gift to contribute And inclusivity, we usually think of people on stage um, when we think of church, but actually the body of Christ includes everyone else, including um, a person who, a kid who comes in who has Down syndrome, he's got something to contribute to. Um, And and it's very challenging because it can seem, um, I guess when you look at kids who are disabled coming in, if we really look at it, sometimes it seems like God's doing more in them than you know a superstar pastor who's on stage. And it really challenges us. I know it challenges me to think about the way I view people, to think about the way I'm including people as well. Um, and yeah, so it's good. The third image is a communion of saints. Paul starts his letters describing us that way a lot. Um, communion referring to the fellowship is a family metaphor and saints referring to us being holy set apart so um, we are to be in the world but not of the world we are light and salt and all of that and finally in Acts 2 we see that the church is actually born in the power of the spirit people are empowered to do what we wouldn't expect them to do Um, 
So you all know, you know that, all that stuff, so we'll just zoom past. Okay, so the creeds are the mark of the church, and as Pentecostals, we aren't really a creed or denomination, but it's still really important. So just looking at um, the Nicene Creed, which was then updated in 381, just that sentence, I believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. Depending on the denomination, looking at the word apostolic, it means different things. So to the Catholics, they see it as having their founding in the apostles. The bishops have to have a direct line from the apostles. So for example, um, Paul to Timothy, Timothy to the next generation, and so on and so forth. A direct teaching that they have actually set under a lineage of people who have set under the apostles. Does that make sense? We don't have that in the Pentecostal church. I cannot say that I've directly learned from someone that's directly learned from, you know, Paul back in the day or Peter or whoever. But for the Catholics, that's very important. And I think it's still true today. Um, yeah, so there we go. Um, so that's the uh, Catholic version of the, uh, what they understand as apostolic. For us, we locate it more in the scriptures. Um, that as long as what we're teaching is foundational in the scriptures, we are apostolic. The Catholics wouldn't deny that either, so there is an overlap there. Um, and the reason that the Catholics did that was to prevent heresy, because in those days, um, the lay person couldn't read. They couldn't read the scriptures, so they were coming up with all sorts of things. So to be a bishop or a leader in the church, you needed to have had good, sound teaching why they insult bishops and all that. Okay, um, Catholic, as I mentioned uh, in the lecture a while back, this is little c, not big c, it just means universal. Um, so the church is a body that transcends just the local, it, it's worldwide. And unity, so um, the Catholic church argues that the church is one organizational structure under the Pope. Um, for us, we, tend to argue that the church is one as a spiritual reality rather than a physical reality. And in the 20th to 21st century, the ecumenical movement, which is, it means universal in terms of church, um, started where, where um, these big denominations came together to tackle what they call the scandal of the church. Um, here we are, called to be one, and yet we're fighting against each other, and it still exists <coughs> today. Um, so we've got to somehow turn a spiritual reality into a concrete reality, and um, yeah, that's something that we're working on, and it's a good thing. And holy, how can a human church be holy? It's full of sinful people. What do you think? We're in it, yep, definitely. How, how can we be a holy church? What defines us as a holy church? So it's the action behind the word. Um, mm. It's not only like, yeah, we, we, we believe in what is, what is said in the Bible and all yeah. that, but it's more the action that, yeah. that relates us to the bit more. It's, it's <coughs> yeah. a little bit closer to what, it's good to have the knowledge, mm. but what we do with it, that's... Uh, yeah, that's definitely. Right. We're sincere, we're genuine, we actually keep our word. Is it a high standard? <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Um, okay, just gonna go on quickly because we look at the time and it's 7.50. Okay, so we're gonna look at um, church structures. Um, I think from there, it's just a little bit longer. Okay, so we've got three different church structures um, on our slides. The first one is episcopal or hierarchical relating to a bishop and this is usually found in um, Catholic churches, more traditional churches, where it flows from the Pope to the Archbishop to the Bishop to the Priest. So that one's quite self-explanatory. Um, there is no single structure in the New Testament, just stressing that. If we look at the history of the New Testament, it starts off really as a subset of the Jewish synagogue. In Acts 2.46, 
it says that um, the New Testament church met every day in the synagogue, so in the temple courts, so that's cool. As it moves out of Jerusalem, it becomes less formal, more home-based. And over the years, because of problems that came up, they had to put in church structures to um, fix that. So it's, it's fluid, and it changed again when um, Constantine became a Christian, and it's still changing today. So going on to the next structure, representational or Presbyterian. Um, here it is when a local church um, has a local pastor that represents them to their denomination. That's quite common among Pente Pentecostal churches and all that. And then there's another one that's not, um, not on the slides. I don't know why, but there wasn't anything. But we'll just quickly go through it. The congregational model. So for this one, their thing is we're all spirit-filled. We all need to have a say in this. So the congregation gets to vote every year for their pastor, and then the pastor represents them. But it's very much everything's based on the congregation. They make the, or we all make the decisions, etc. So that's another model. Um, yeah. Okay. So Pentecostalism. Um, Shane Clifton's PhD. Shane Clifton's PhD um, was on this topic, tracking the change in the church. It is just representative of um, other denominations as well. It started at the beginning of the 20th century, founded by a person we wouldn't expect, Agnes Osmond, who uh, was a nobody at that time. Now, William Seymour then, who was a student, and because he was black, he had to sit outside the classroom for, of Charles Parham. And some even say that Charles Parham was a part of the Ku Klux Klan. So it's quite incredible that God chose a woman to be the first person, supposedly, to receive the spirit baptism, and then chooses an African-American to bring about revival in a very racist society. Um, it's, it's incredible. And then we see towards the end of the century, we had almost, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, we had almost 500 million, so half a billion um, people call themselves Pentecostals. And you can read the rest of the stats as well. Um, I don't want to go too much into all that stuff. There is a lot of history here. This slide, is this working? Oh, you do it. It is working. Oh, it is working? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I won't go through that because it is covered in spirit baptism. The spirit empowers us, empowers people we don't expect, etc. And that's the founding of the church. Um, Sarah Jane Lancaster, we did um, speak about her as well. She's the first person to found a Pentecostal church in Australia. Again, God using a woman, which was amazing. Um, and she was very reluctant to talk about structure in the church. Because she believed that traditional churches had people trapped in their religion. And she said, we're not another church. We're not another organization. We're an organism. Um, they viewed themselves as spirit-filled people who transcended all of that, who had a shared spirituality. So what ca categorizes Pentecostalism? We're grounded in the spirit. Um, we have spiritual unity. Sometimes we forget that, but we're still fighting for that. Um, and personal empowerment. So it starts in surprising places. It's not really um, so structured. So that as a grassroots movement, Pentecostalism could go to places that uh, traditional churches couldn't, which is a really great thing. In the 1920s and 30s, Pentecostalism became more popular. So then the question was, who should we have leading and preaching and what do we do about heresy? And this was important because there were some early crazy Pentecostals. They believe in the Trinity. They believe in some of the foundational stuff that we have today. And so they started putting in government and structures. And they started using the congregational system because um, they believe everyone's spirit and filth. So they did that. Uh, we don't have that anymore. A lot of churches don't even have AGMs anymore. So it has changed. And in the process of change, some pastors like David Cartledge and Frank Houston felt that the congregational model was quite restraining. Um, so Frank Houston, he 
um, in 1978, he started the CLC movement. I think he planted about 20 of them. And he gave the authority to the senior pastor instead of the congregation. So it all changed from there. And, um, and I guess the thing that we need to just look at with change is just to ask, what have we gained? What have we lost? We don't have to go back to the past to fix what we have lost, but we can look at that and use creative ways. Um, and yeah, so I just thought we'll break up into um, three groups, just do the pros and cons of each structure. So if we do three, if not coming back, three and three. Okay, okay so if you guys do the episcopal hierarchy, um, structure. Look at the pros and cons for a church, um, and then if you guys do with Mark and the representative representative one, and if you do the congregational one, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Oh. Well, we were struggling to find pros for yeah. congregational. <laughs> 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 pros are churches appear to be independent in the New Testament. Yeah, you can say they're closer to you around. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to hear me. It's not on. Yeah, it's on now. It recognises the, the significance of each individual believer. It's demographic and it's democratic. That's it's <laughs> local church autonomy. The cons that it may foster overly independent spirit, lack sense of history or continuing issues of the past, may lead itself to charismatic leaders accountable to no one, and there's possible doc doctrinal quirkiness and easy church split. I didn't hear any of that. Can you repeat it? I'll tell you the website. It's called keepbelieving.com. I'm already in trouble. Um, the church is not a democracy. So we shouldn't be a democracy. So that idea is not a good one. <laughs> what are you? Um, we're Presbyterian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's about accountability and having a structure in place. Um, and it's the way that, that God has structured things. Yeah. Um, it's certainly the way that uh, Jesus um, structured with his discipleship. Um, so it's designed so that if the, if the pastor of the church starts to get some weird ideas, there's some leadership above them to, to pull them into line. Yeah. Um, and and there's standards in place that, that need to be adhered to. Oh, and the cons. Yes. There are cons. If the movement starts to go a bit astray, yeah. there's nothing to pull it into line. Yeah. Um, also, if someone has uh, a new revelation, there's not that freedom that you get with that strange idea that those guys have. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So we've got the Episcopal um, system. So <coughs> it's based on a hierarchy. Um, the pros, so basically they're they on the so basically we do like the church. <laughs> so basically um, there is pastor Joel, and then there's counter pastors, and then there's the, I guess, pastoral team, and then the congregation. Do you want to just Okay, well that's basically it. So the hierarchy kind of structure. So the pros to this is, um, so the highest leader would be dealing with everyone directly. So um, they, they're freed up there um, to yeah, do more in a sense of oversight and make sure that everything um, is <laughs> uh, I'm just continuing on to what Dan said. Um, so like the hierarchy, um, so um, oh, now the microphone might lost. Um, yes, it's horrible. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So um, 
Well, for the pros is you would have other leaders that um, that um, the senior leaders give oversight to to trust other areas in. So, uh, for example, Pastor Joel has his campus partner that he that he relies heavily on that he can trust that um can help in the um, area of discipleship and that sort of thing. And the campus pastors oversight the pastoral team, so then they, they can pass the people and stuff as well. Um, there's um, the system of training leaders in that system as well, so um, um, yeah, there's constant training, that sort of thing. Um, the cons is um, that the senior leader would know everyone, as Pastor Joel has said before. Um, sometimes he's dealing with things indirectly as well, and that's all we have. So we'll add teamwork, thanks for joining work. <laughs> I think another pro for this is just that there is like one kind of decision, like final decision.